Hey there, welcome to the Caledonia Gathering. My name is Corey, and, and we're so glad that you decided to, to join us today. You know, our mission is to tell people about the life and love of Jesus and to inspire you and to help you to learn to live and love like him. And if that's something that you're interested in, you haven't already, we wanna encourage you to hit the subscribe button to join this community. And uh, if you've got kids and you're not really sure what to do with them during the service, we have a special uh, activity and program for them that's led by our Family Ministries Director, Johanna, and you can find that in the link in the description. You know, before we jump in today, I just want to tell you that the way that we learn to live and love like Jesus together is by singing together, by praying together, and by opening up the, the scriptures together and reading not only what Jesus himself said, but also what some of his earliest followers said. And so before we jump into our task today, uh, we're going to get our hearts and our minds in the right place by singing together. So let's sing. Christ alone, Christ alone, what is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong, who holds our deeds within His hand, what comes apart from His command, in what will keep us to the end, the love of Christ in which we stand Oh, sing Hallelujah Our hope springs eternal Oh, sing Hallelujah Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death
been held by your hands from the moment that I wake up till I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God all my life you have been fed the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You were close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'll surrender now. I give you everything. Is running. 
so, so good With every breath that I am able Ooh, I will sing of the goodness Hey there, we're going to be continuing our series today called Leading a Legacy, talking about how to live life well, especially when life's not going well. And, and today we're going to take a look at some of the more controversial verses that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. Now, before we jump in here, I, I want to remind you, here's what Paul is most concerned about, coaching Timothy on how to encourage people to live well when life's not going well. And, and for Timothy and in his churches uh, that he's pastoring, life's not going well. There's all kinds of conflict and confusion for how to follow Jesus in these tumultuous times for all kinds of different reasons. And, and what Paul wants for people the most is to know and live in light of God's incredible mercy and grace, which he has for everyone. Now, with that in mind, uh, let's jump into some of those more controversial verses. Verse 9, I also want the women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds, appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Now, i got to be totally honest with you. I feel for Timothy here. I mean, he's clearly talked to Paul about the conduct of some of the men in the churches, and, and we addressed that stuff last week. And now he's talked to Paul about the conduct of some of the women in the churches, and now Paul's answer to him is to go back and talk to the women about the way that they're dressing. Now, you got to remember, Timothy's not a seasoned grandfather who can sort of speak to them as a grandfather does to his daughters or granddaughters. He, he's a young leader. It's kind of puts them in an awkward position having to advise women on how they dress, which kind of raises an interesting question. What's going on with the women in the Ephesian churches? And what, if anything, does it have to do with us, especially us guys? I mean, is this just about bold clothes and braided hair, or, or is there something more going on here? Now, before we get too deep into understanding the instruction, I, I think it, it's helpful to really know some things about the context. And, and there are some hints in the text that we don't necessarily see that, that give us pointers towards the context, but we don't see them because we don't speak Greek and we don't live in first century Ephesus. So, so let me help you with just a little bit of background, which will help you understand why Paul wrote what he wrote. You see, number one, the city of Ephesus is a multicultural hub in the ancient world, home to all kinds of different religions, which means it was also home to a few of the only female-dominated religious cults of the first century. Some of these, like the cult of Artemis, were simply just all-female cults. The priests, the leaders, the decision makers, from the top of the religion to the bottom, they, they were all women. But others of the cults were different. They weren't just female-driven cults but they were notably anti-male and, and overtly promoted flaunting female sexuality. And so that's the other thing that's going on in this city. And no doubt some of those cult adherents joined the Jesus movement and they kind of brought their old ways of life with them. Now, one of the other trends that was going on in the city had more to do with fashion. And in particular, we know quite a bit about the fashion of wealthy single women who weren't married. They would dress in a way that was sexually revealing and very expensive. 
You see, the words that Paul uses in the Greek for modest are explicitly sexually charged restrictions. And, and so he was sort of telling them not to dress like the upper class single women because their fashion trends, like the fashion trends of the rich and famous today, always made their way down to the social strata to every other class of people. I mean, people have always had a desire to keep up appearances, be it an appearance of success or to be desirable or an appearance of, of being attractive, you name it. And there was no different then. And so Paul, I, you gotta know, he's not criticizing wealthy single ladies here. He's criticizing a style of first century dress from a class of first century people who promoted an overtly anti-Jesus lifestyle. And, and it wasn't just anti-Jesus because it was pagan or anti-Jesus because it was anti-male, but because quite literally it was a style of, of clothing and lifestyle that promoted excess and luxury at the expense of being able to help other people. I mean, you would be tempted to spend so much money on your outward appearance that you would have nothing left for other pursuits that would be worthy of a Jesus follower, like caring for those who are in need. In essence, what Paul was saying was, Timothy, say to the ladies, hey, nice Gucci handbags, but it's kind of too bad that you care more about spending money and time on how you look than actually helping other people. Now, I, I want to settle something right quick here at the beginning and, and admit to you that it's true. The Apostle Paul is giving gender-specific instructions. He explicitly names women. There's no way around it. He tells them to dress with modesty, decency, and in moderation, and, and to forego expensive jewelry and gold and pearls and elaborate hairstyles, which, by the way, in Greek just simply means braided hair. His particular instructions are gender-specific, but they are that way because of the Ephesian context. His principle, however, is not gender-specific. Whether you're a man or you're a woman, the principle is the same character is defined by your conduct, not your clothing or your cost of living. In other words, what, what Paul wants these people to know, and probably us too, is, is if your pursuit of a particular appearance puts you at odds with others in your community, you're doing it wrong. Does that make sense? I mean, if you dress in a way that hinders your ability to help those who are in need, it is decidedly anti-Jesus. When, when Paul says to use a sense of propriety when dressing yourself, the word there literally means to use your soundness of mind, common sense. In other words, does the money and time you spend on how you look make sense with the type of person that you want to be? Now, this is a really important aspect to understanding Paul's principle here. Now, his instruction is not necessarily like, oh, we all need to take a vow of poverty. Or, we can't wear anything except burlap sacks and bandanas. It's not that Paul's forbidding owning nice things. The question is, do the nice things you spend your time and money on make sense given the type of person you'd like to be? And, and if the type of person you want to be is a Jesus follower, then what do you suppose he would think of what you spent your time and money on? Now, if you're not sure what Jesus would think, maybe I can offer some help there. Because Jesus actually said some pretty harsh words on this whole idea before. It was while he was chastising religious leaders one day while he was teaching in Jerusalem. He was kind of reading them their rap sheet. And one of the things that he said to them was, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. Now, in Jesus' day, the tombs were, were outside the city of Jerusalem, which is where Jesus was teaching when he said these things. And, and that matters because that meant that all kinds of people would pass the tombs on their way up the hill into Jerusalem. And, and the reason people would then whitewash the tombs, while it did make them beautiful on the outside, it also alerted travelers who were walking by to their presence. Otherwise, they might have gone unnoticed. Now, you whitewash the tombs in order to alert people to say, hey, there's a tomb here. Now, why would you do that? Well, because for the Jewish people, there was this law that stated that if they got too close to a dead body, they would be considered ceremonially unclean. And they'd have to go through this whole process in order to get cleansed. So, so really, if, if you were traveling with your family, trying to go and celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem, 
things would kind of get ruined if you happened to step too close to a dead body that was buried in a tomb along the road. It would kind of ruin everything. But, but here's Jesus' point when he's warning the religious leaders. He's warning them not to care more about how they look on the outside than their actual character and conduct on the inside. But at the same time, he's also warning everyone else who is listening to avoid people like this. They're whitewashed tombs, he said. Yeah, they look good on the outside, but they're dead on the inside and you shouldn't get too close. Avoid whitewashed tombs. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to Paul's instruction about not spending all your time and money to maintain an appearance. Because for Paul, it's not just about how you look. It's about your choice at the expense of truly good deeds. You should instead dress yourself with moderation, says Paul, in order to truly adorn yourself with good deeds, because that's what's fitting of a Jesus follower. Now, why is that what, what's fitting of a Jesus follower? I mean, think about it. Jesus chose humility in order to help. Really, he did that for you. I mean, go back and reread Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Reread about the life of Jesus. And what you will find is that Jesus chose the humble route in order to maximize how much he could help others over and over. He didn't show up to earth wearing expensive clothes, riding a mighty war horse, or demanding expensive treatment. Jesus came humbly, and he was born into a feeding trough. He, he ran from people when they tried to crown him king, and and then in his greatest display of love and humility, he gave himself up as a ransom for all people. Remember when Paul opened the letter that way? Jesus gave his whole life away to help, to literally save people. He, he did it for me, says Paul last week. Me, a violent and vehement enemy of his. And if he did it for me, he probably did it for you too. And so for all the times that you've spent time and money and resources all on yourself rather than on good deeds for others, know that Jesus went to the cross for you and he paid for those sins. So that even though you may have lived like a whitewashed tomb up until this point in your life, looking good on the outside but just dead on the inside, know that Jesus gave his life so that you could be resurrected, to bring you back to life, real life, the kind of life that you can live well, even when life's not going that well. And so Paul, in his second instruction to Timothy, and it, uh, in his, instru uh, his instruction for, for people on how to lead a legacy, how to live well when life's not going well, is simply this. Dress for devotion. Dress for devotion. Dress in a way that would allow you to be devoted to good works. In other words, choose Christ-like character defined by your conduct not your clothing or your cost of living. Now, I've got to say, I think that this is probably just as, if not more difficult today than it was for those back in Ephesus in the first century. For starters, we're often slave to the fashion trends of, of the people that we admire, but this goes way beyond clothing. I mean, we more than ever live in a day and age where every single day we're encouraged to spend all kinds of time, money, and resources on keeping up appearances. And, and so we leverage ourselves to the point where we live with so little margin that we leave no room for doing good, for helping others. I mean, it's so easy for me. And, and I would wager a guess it's probably easy for you as well. But it's easy for us to buy into the cultural lie that I deserve to have a house this big. I deserve to drive a car this nice. I deserve to have a, a, go to a school this expensive. I deserve to buy clothes that cost this much. I deserve to have those things. That is all a first world lie. And, and we end up stretching and leveraging and borrowing and putting on credit, not only the cost of our appearance, but, but ultimately we're sacrificing our character and our ability to do good for others in order to keep that appearance up so much of the time. I mean, I might pull this back and regret it, but, but I want to tell you this because 
I want you to know I'm not coming from the outside acting as though I'm unaffected. I'm, I'm with you in this 100%. I live in a house now with my wife and small infant son that is bigger than the house I grew up in with my family of seven. My mom, my dad, five growing boys of which I'm the runt, I'm the smallest. My point is I'm affected by the same lie you are. I'm with you to define my character based on my clothing or cost of living, to believe that I deserve more. Now, now that I've gotten that out of the way, here's the uncomfortable question for all of us, especially those of you who are adults. If we sat down and we took a look at your budget, or if you don't have a budget, if we just looked at your uh, spending history and your bank statements, does the cost of your mortgage or your rent, your cars, your vacations, your clothing, your education bills, and your living expenses, does, does it leave you room to do good for others? See, I don't think Paul would show up today and write us a letter saying you can't have gold, pearls, or braids in your hair. I think he would write a letter today asking us the question, could we look at the way you spend your money and say, oh, here's a person who lives and loves like Jesus. Here's a person who has devoted themselves to doing good for others. Here's a person who intentionally lives on less so that they can leverage more of what they have for the sake of others rather than spending it at the expense of others in need. See, I know this is a big task, but but how can I look you in the eyes and just grab a hold of you and, and not let you go so that you hear me on this? You need to do this. As one of my favorite pastors and authors says, you should be knowing where your money's going. You should be knowing where your money's going. And here's what's interesting. When you intentionally choose to live with margin, as Paul would say, with a sense of moderation and propriety, then when crisis hits, you won't be in fits so quickly because you weren't living beyond your means. You weren't living so tight. You might even be able to maintain your ability to help others. So, so the first instruction, sit down, look at your expenses and your cost of living and decide where are we going to intentionally drop our lifestyle in order to help others. Now, secondly, and this goes for everyone, kids, teenagers, adults, if we sat down and looked at your schedule, which is basically a budget for how you spend your time, if we sat down and looked at how you did spend your time, if we did a time study and tracked every activity for how you spent your time, would we be able to say, oh, here's a person who lives and loves like Jesus. Here's a person who has intentionally involved themselves in less activities to build their resume or pad their college application or play in every sport offered and instead chosen to do less in order to devote themselves to doing good for others. I mean, after all the homework, all the sporting events, all the TV watching, social media scrolling, and hanging out with friends, is there time left to give away by doing good for others? Is there time left to volunteer? And here's why this matters. Again, because if you want to live life well, especially when life isn't going well, if you want to lead the kind of life that's worth remembering and being remembered for, if you want to lead a legacy, you need to let your character be defined by your con conduct, not your clothes or your cost of living. Make room for others. Devote yourself to doing good. Now, now you may be thinking to yourself, hey, Corey, I read the passage with you at the beginning and I thought, Oof, I'm off the hook this week. I don't wear any gold, I don't own any pearls, and I'm not really into that braiding, that into braiding my hair. Uh, I might as well skip this week. And now I'm starting to think, boy, this whole Jesus follow thing is actually going to be tough. In which case, I would say you're right. It's not easy to say no to yourself. It takes self-control to live with a sense of propriety, as in proportion. A portion to God, a portion for others, a portion for us. But just imagine. Just imagine for a moment what you could do personally or as a family if you followed Paul's coaching here. Just imagine how, how different the next crisis or job loss or pandemic would feel if you lived with more room. Imagine what we could do as a community if we decided to devote ourselves to doing good. And I mean intentionally making room in our schedules, our budgets, and our lives to do good for others. To, to make meals for someone in need. 
when it becomes available again to, to serve downtown at Mel Trotter or Guiding Light or Degashe. Maybe to coach a kid's soccer team and start investing in the kids around us. Maybe to disciple somebody, mentor them, and encourage them. Maybe it's the ability to pay someone's rent or buy their groceries or maybe even pay their tuition. I mean, what would it be like to have that kind of impact instead of just going after a bigger house or a newer car or a nicer clothes. Not that any of those things are inherently wrong, but rather, what if we lived in more moderation to have the room to do good for others, even when life's not going that good for us, to allow our character to be defined by our conduct, not our clothes or our cost of living. And besides, Ultimately, if you think about it, that's what Jesus did for you.
Wow, thanks so much again for joining us this week. You know, uh, each week at this point in our service, we, we flash up the, the, the URL for you to be able to give online at the caledoniagathering.org slash giving. And I thought it'd be good for us to pause this week and just, just tell you why we do that. I mean, we don't, we don't invite people to give because we want something from you as a church. But, but the reason we invite people to give, we invite you to give, is because we want something for you. You, you know, at, at our house and, and in our church, we, we give for a couple of reasons. Number one, though, the number one reason is because we believe that a regular habit, a regular practice of giving shapes us to be generous people. And the reason we want to be generous people is because we worship a generous God and we want to live and love like his son, Jesus. And so regular giving week after week, pra that practice of generosity, it sort of strengthens that generosity muscle within us. And, and we want that for you. I, I mean, who doesn't want to be a generous person? And then the second reason that we invite you to give is because we think it's, it's one of the ways that God invites us to be a part of what he's doing in the world, telling people about the life and love of Jesus, um, especially through the Caledonia gathering. And so, um, I pray that, that if you feel led, and, and I want to challenge you to, to start a practice, a regular habit of giving so that you can grow that generosity muscle, become the kind of person you really want to be, and to participate in God's mission and what he's doing in the world, especially through the Caledonia gathering. So may the Lord bless you as you give. And let's close by singing the doxology together. Father, Son, and